good afternoon all we are about to start our session of systemic diseases with the eye i am dr rahul tiwari i will be moderating this session we have our wise counsels with us dr ajit babu sir may i request dr ajit babu sir to please come on the desk dr lalit verma sir dr brigadier sanjay kumar mishra sir dr avinash sir and dr michael stewart uh dr jay said uh, will talk about the drugs and the retina please start yeah uh, good afternoon everyone first of all thank you vrsi for giving me this opportunity to speak on this uh, very interesting but a uh, vast topic that is drugs and the retina and uh, in 5 minutes i'll try to do as much justice as possible to this topic so uh, although modern medicine has uh, revolutionized uh, our management of systemic disorders but at the same time you know administrating these newer drugs has led to uh, increasing toxicities with any uh, variable amount of agents and involving all parts of the body and uh, this is especially true in patients uh, uh, and in the retinal involvement also because it has got a dual blood supply and uh, since it is also very highly metabolically active so you know it places it at a higher risk of developing these toxicities so uh, these toxicities to retina can be classified based on the you know the layer of involvement whether the rpe or the photoreceptor damage is there or it can have a various manifestations in the form of a crystalline deposits or a vasculopathy edema development visual disturbances as well as retinal folds so we'll go through each of them one by one the commonest rpe toxicity that is seen is with quinones that is the hydroxychloroquine and the chloroquine which are usually used for autoimmune disorders and malaria and recently they were used uh, very widespread for the management of covid also so it causes a slow chronic delayed kind of a toxicity which is uh, dose dependent and uh, depends on the duration of the usage also and a worsening is seen with if the patient is having concomitant kidney or a liver disorder now these patients uh, they develop this toxicity usually after a period of 5 years hence if you look at the screening guidelines uh, it is advised to have a look at these patients at baseline and annually after 5 years and the primary test that is advised is a spectral domain oct followed followed by a visual field analysis an autofluorescence or a multifocal erg may or may not be done depending on the availability now a uh, very important point to note is in non nations usually we see a central involvement so a 10-2 visual field is sufficient whereas if we look at asian population it is a paramacular involvement that is usually common as we see in these autofluorescent images so there may be a central sparing so it's very important to advise either a 24-2 or a 30-2 in asian population and timely uh, recognition and cessation of therapy is very important in these patients because the retinopathy is usually irreversible in these patients now another agent that causes a dose dependent uh, toxicity to the mm -hmm. retina is pentosan polysulfate and it is it usually causes hyperpigment and macular spots with subretinal yellowish deposits and if uh, the drug is not stopped timely then it can progress to development of cme or even a macular neovascularization now the development of uh, these toxicities to uh, due to pentosan is can usually start within the first few years of starting the therapy so it is advised to screen these patients at baseline and subsequently annually then there are drugs like phenothiazines that cause a diffuse rp involvement and uh, that is uh, usually it starts within 3 to 8 uh, weeks of starting the therapy and a salt and pepper pigment retinopathy can develop uh, within few weeks to a few months also so hence early recognition is needed in these patients and other agents like uh, didenosine also cause a peripheral rp atrophic kind of a picture and it usually spares the macula other anti retroviral agents such as rifabutin and sildenafil can be associated with concurrent uh, uveitic uh, entity also then there may be a rp dysfunction with anti neoplastic agents such as mek inhibitors and uh, Uh, the ch immune checkpoint inhibitor so that can lead to a multifocal uh, csr kind of a picture and even a vkh uh, kind of a syndrome in these patients and corticosteroids of course as we know we come across many patients who develop uh, rp dysfunction and unifocal or multifocal csr due to these agents and even the um, uh, recreational drug the mdma can lead to csr development few other central macular involvement in the form of uh, vitelliform lesions can be seen with iron chelators and a bullseye maculopathy can be uh, seen with uh, 
clofazimine that is used for atypical mycobacterial infections. The other retinal involvement can be in the form of crystalline deposits that can occur in different layers of the retina. The inner retinal layer is usually involved in uh, uh, patients who are taking tamoxifen, talc, uh, nitrofurutan and can canthazanthine. Whereas the inhalational anesthetic agent methoxyfluorine causes calcium oxalate depositions in the RPE layer. Now of note is the development of uh, occlusive vasculitis with uh, talc therapy. So uh, early recognition is very important. Then few other agents that can lead to occlusive vasculitis includes chemotherapeutic agents like cisplatin and uh, the occurrence of macular infarction is, has been reported very widely with aminoglycosides in the 80s and the 90s. Whereas minor involvement in the form of paternal spots and hemorrhages can be seen with interferon therapy. Uh, the use of estrogen and progesterone therapy also leads to a hypercoagulable state which can lead to development of a retinal venous occlusions in patients. Then fewer urgent agents can cause just a visual disturbance in the form of either a transient or a permanent uh, nyctalopia due to retinoids, whereas a xanthopsia is very common in patients who are taking digitalis therapy. Now alteration of colored vision and loss of vision is common with the quinine agent that is uh, currently used for restless leg syndrome and also it is a uh, composition of the tonic water and also with sildenafil and other erectile dysfunction medications. Then macular edema is seen in patients who are on niacin and in, of note is this causes a more of an IRF collection uh, due to Müller cell damage. So the, there is no leakage on fluorescein angiography in these patients. Whereas other uh, oral antihypoglycemic medications like rosiglitazone and pioglitazone can lead to CME development. So asking a proper history is very important in, patient, in diabetic patients because that could be one of the reasons for non-response to uh, intravitreal anti vegf agents. Now coming to the last couple of manifestations that are development of retinal folds due to sulfur medications like Dimox and Topiramate because it causes a uh, in, uh, reduced intraocular pressure and that can lead to development of choroidal and retinal folds. And the other is the use of recreational drugs, poppers or also known as a volatile alkaline nitrate. So that causes a bilateral permanent visual loss due to photoreceptor loss. So just to summarize, uh, although the blood retinal barrier, it prevents unlimited access to all these systemic medications to the retina, but uh, nonetheless the exposure is high because of the dual blood supply. So it is very important to create awareness amongst the physicians who are prescribing these medications and timely referral to uh, the ophthalmologist. And once they present to us an early and accurate diagnosis using a multimodal imaging is very essential to advise a proper drug discontinuation to prevent a permanent visual loss. So these are my references. Thank you. And just a few pointers for discussion, like how do we increase the pharmacovigilance with newer and newer drug therapies that are involving? How frequently do we communicate with the treating physician? And what is a retinal physician's role in assessing the benefit to risk ratio, you know, when we are prescribing this medicine? And is there an unmet need for a unified healthcare record? Because many of our patients in developing countries, they don't carry their uh, entire list of medications. So is, you know, do we actually go for a unified healthcare record system too for a better documentation of these medications? Thank you. Very nice presentation, uh, Jay. Regarding the uh, unified medical record presentation, uh, uh, what is your opinion uh, regarding this, Lalit, sir? Meanwhile, we, uh, when we are starting with the discussion, may I request Dr. Sunil Gupta to uh, upload your uh, presentation? The next speaker. Rahul, uh, I agree with, uh, you see, all these things about to talk of physicians, even even, even ophthalmologists uh, may not be aware of so many drug toxicities. So, uh, I agree because it has to have a uniform record listing these agents so that physicians are careful and ophthalmologists are also careful. And uh, I don't know how much, uh, is, is in the West there or? Maybe Dr. Stewart, maybe pro like that. So we don't have that. Uh, granted, you know, the quick backtrack, backtrack to the original question about the uniform mental health, uh, health, health record. Uh, in the United States, the, the biggest medical record system is called EPIC, and about 70% of all major medical institutions have it. Where there's nothing on a, man, on a national basis, EPIC is gobbling up share, and it would not be surprising to me 
to see that eventually be incorporated by the U.S. government and mandated by the government. And, and so we may actually have a number of records. The good thing about that is that we then have access to the records of the patient no matter where they are. Uh, and right now we have common medical records throughout the entire Mayo Clinic system throughout the United States. Uh, but we can also view the records from other healthcare institutions to follow that as well. And in doing so, we then have common uh, lists of medications. We have, you know, co common laboratory tests, et cetera. And it's much easier to follow them and then ultimately determine have they been update or up to date on all their medical surveillance. Just additional points. When we have the drug interaction, so patients walk into the clinic. So the way I look at it is whether they come for screening or they have an established toxicity. So common drug which we get to see, we rightly put it as HCQ, something which is more common in most of the clinics. And you also touched upon a point that, you know, uh, the non-Caucasian population have a higher tendency to develop toxicity. You also touched upon the point, it's just not the center of the fovea, it's the parafoveal area which is important. Now, having said that, uh, the additional point which I would like to say is uh, do not discount multifocal ERT in this and, and do not look at the, uh, uh, the peaks. Peaks is not something which you have to look at. Look at for individual waveforms and correlate with the visual fields and you will be able to see them when you have a scotoma spot and if there is an attenuation of amplitude in the multifocal ERT, that will be a good indices for you to look at it. Right? That's one aspect. But the next which is evolving in this con country in, in terms of toxicity is in the clinic is ethambutol toxicity which is increasing. And third is I think myself and Dr. Ajit Babu were discussing that commonness of trivial efficiency uh, which is following topiramate. Bilateral trivial efficient or patients presenting with yes. bilateral acute angle closure angle glaucoma. Closures. It's, right. it's not a primary, it's not a primary, it's always, always, the secondary has to be ticked first before you say you come to the, the primary part of it. See, ethambutol is one thing which uh, when, uh, I personally may stop after two, three months. Because uh, physicians, they yeah. tend to continue dosage of 1,000 uh, milligram for you know, seven, eight months. But uh, all of us know that uh, beyond two, three months, uh, uh, it has an increased chance of uh, obtainuritis. And uh, uh, Jay, I, I thought uh, you didn't touch that. Yeah, because uh, I, I didn't uh, go to the nerve. Uh, yeah, RP arterfluorescence is another very sensitive test, and it, it, we can detect it very, very early. Actually, dose-dependent uh, uh, toxicity happens with HCQ, total cumulative dose cumulative rather than an individual uh, daily dose uh, pattern. So always uh, I go for uh, RP arterfluorescence, so that very early changes yeah, can maybe. detect and uh, ask them to titrate or change the drug you know, to the ortho rheumatologist. That would be very helpful. Lalit, I think it's a high time for us to come up with a good write-up from AOS for all the drug toxicities we need to include and the minimum tests that need to be performed with each of the, these drugs. That would be a good booklet for uh, everyone for us to have a reference about. I have one additional point because you mentioned about the toxicity which can happen in risk factors like liver disorders, right? That's from the systemic point of view. But when the patient is being referred for screening, uh, uh, look at macular disorders because macular disorders, pre existing macular disorders are also a risk Ready. factor for uh, hydroxychloroquine Ooh. toxicity. And it's interesting to hear the difference in what drugs we're worried about here versus in the United States. In the United States, everybody's worried about hydroxychloroquine because it's given so often. And I, I, I have to sometimes push back on rheumatologists and tell them I don't need to see them twice every year beginning the day they're started. So that's one. But the one that's really increasing significantly in the U.S. In, is uh, pentosin. Uh, and the problem with pentosin is that it works really well and there's nothing else for hemorrhagic cystitis. The, the urologists just don't have another drug. So that's a problem uh, that we, Thing because we're not screening it properly and there's no good alternative. Yeah. Is there one more drug which is now coming more and more, specifically the uveitis clinic are the checkpoint inhibitors which are yeah. being used by patients for their carcinomas. Yeah. And these are coming back to us with picture which absolutely resembles a VKH. Yeah. That's why it becomes important in these cases to take a history 
before we jump into our diagnosis of VKH because we have in the last six months only seen three patients who are on nivolumab came back with an absolute VKH like picture. So I think that is one more disease which is going to come more and more as our oncologist colleagues become more comfortable in using more of these checkpoint yeah, inhibitors. That is a drug of choice for melanomas. Yeah. melanoma. And Bishop yes, uh, um, I request uh, Dr. Uh, Sunil Gupta, if he is not you. there, Dr. Apurva to upload uh, his, her presentation. Uh, one more uh, question I would uh, want to ask uh, Vice Council is uh, in the AKT, uh, ethambutal toxicity is known, but then apart from that, isoniazide is also known to have uh, the optic neuropathy. Uh, would you uh, ask the physician to stop isoniazide? Uh, along with the ethambutal, or when would you like to, to stop isoniazide? Ashish, sir. Uh, I have never asked, to be frank, to stop IMS. I have always asked for them to stop ethambutal because uh, we, it's very hard to find out whether the toxicity is due to INH or ethambutal, but we start with ethambutal first, and then if it does not, INS. But uh, to be frank, in 22 years, I've never asked anyone to stop INS. Actually, the toxicity of ethambutal and INH are isolated and they are independent. So, uh, first thing, a drug that comes high up is uh, ethambutal. So, we always concentrate on stopping the ethambutal first and then reevaluate these patients. It's always important. Certain times, you are having a toxicity to INH and you are not concentrating on uh, stopping the INH. Certain times, the progress of optic neuropathy related to INH can progress. Uh, the next talk, Dr. Apurva, on pregnancy and I. Thank you for the opportunity. So, my topic is retinal diseases in pregnancy. Pregnancy is an altered physiological uh, state with blood pressure alterations, increased insulin resistance, increased serum cortisol and catecholamines, and it is a hypercoagulable state. Diabetic retinopathy is probably one of the most common uh, disease to be altered or to start in pregnancy. So, I am talking about diabetes. So, diabetic retinopathy can uh, have an onset or it can worsen during pregnancy. Older mothers and women uh, with higher BMI and type 2 diabetes can have uh, worse uh, risk of diabetic retinopathy. And a screening for pre-gestational diabetic uh, women uh, has to be done before conception. So the prevalence of retinopathy in pre-gestational diabetes is 10 to 35%. Uh, the percentage of having retinopathy at the first exam in type 1 diabetics is very high, more than half. And uh, type 2 diabetics have uh, retinopathy at the first exam uh, between 17 and 28%. So uh, it is commoner to have progression of diabetic retinopathy during gestation in type 1 diabetics, it's a very wide range from 8 to 70 percent. Increased severity at baseline has an increased risk of progression. There can be a progression to PDR very aggressively during pregnancy and there is a possibility of spontaneous regression after delivery. So these are the risk factors for progression of diabetic retinopathy, a poor baseline glycemic control and interestingly a greater reduction in HbA1c in the first trimester. Duration of diabetes and duration of insulin therapy have been shown to have higher rates of progression. If there is more than 15 years of diabetic duration with insulin therapy, uh, the risk is 39% versus 18% with a lower duration. Uh, obviously, diabetic women, it is advisable to start or plan the pregnancy younger and have a lower HbA1c preconception. Less than 6% is ideal. A pre-existing hypertension or a pregnancy-induced hypertension is a risk factor again. Surveillance is important. Every diabetic woman should have a baseline screening for DR. Uh, and if there is no DR at baseline, uh, the next can be at the first trimester. If that is also normal, then the third trimester. Uh, if there is mild or moderate diabetic retinopathy at baseline, then every trimester screening is necessary. And if there are more severe forms, severe grades of NPDR, then every four to six weeks screening is necessary. And if there is a PDR or even some studies and some authors have said that a very severe NPDR can undergo an urgent PRP in view of risk of progression to PDR. 
Diabetic macular edema is commoner in type 2 diabetics and laser is preferred compared to uh, intravitreals. So during delivery and post delivery, there is of course a theoretical risk of Valsalva. Epidural anesthesia in the second stage of labor is recommended to avoid maternal pushing. So a fluorescein angiography, there is a potential risk of fluorescein crossing the placenta and there is an increased permeability of blood brain barrier in the fetus. Coming to hypertensive retinopathy and choroidopathy, we know that uh, there are uh, features typical of hypertensive retinopathy. In addition to that, there can be uh, features uh, of accelerated hypertension such as subretinal fluid, optic disc edema, choroidal ischemia in the form of choroidal infarcts and uh, exudative detachments. These are especially commoner in uh, HELP syndrome and 15% uh, uh, of women with preeclampsia uh, can have severer forms of uh, hypertensive retinopathy and exudative RDs in these cases are typically associated with more uh, amount of yellowish white exudates. DIC can also have exudative RD. Arterial occlusions can occur. Again, the risk factors are hypertension, preeclampsia, eclampsia, and APLA syndrome. Uh, apart from the major retinal artery occlusions, one can also have Percher retinopathy and there can be choroidal infarcts. Uh, HELP syndrome is a risk factor for venous occlusion. Uh, HELP, we know, is hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and a low platelet count. And DIC is another risk factor for venous occlusions. So central serous chorioretinopathy is a condition that can have an onset or can have recurrent attacks or progression or multiple attacks in pregnancy. The odds ratio of having a CSC in during pregnancy is almost 7.1. Uh, the third trimester uh, CSC is most common because of the increased uh, serum catecholamines. CSC in pregnancy is uh, more common with subretinal fibrin exudative detachments. First line therapy is discontinuation of steroids, if any. Fluorescein angiography is a concern. This is a very nice case uh, managed by uh, Dr. Aditya Maitre. Uh, this was a case of uh, uh, severe bullous CSC with nanophthalmos uh, in a patient on in vitro fertilization treatment. This was a neurosensory dip and a small mi RP micro rip with fibrin and a vacuole sign, which can be a very good guide for laser treatment. So this patient on IVF underwent a subthreshold uh, laser to the subfovial leak and this was the outcome which was pretty good. And during pregnancy at 20 weeks she developed the left eye CSC and here there was a small PED with a rip and a lot of SRF. Again subthreshold micropulse was guided by the OCT signs of fibrin and vacuole sign. And the concern in such high risk pregnancy is then again for fetal maturation these uh, women have uh, to be started on third trimester steroids. There are increased VEGF levels in pregnancy, which is why uh, uh, they can have choroidal neovascularization due to all the causes known. Uh, choroidal venous congestion can be seen, uh, especially in pregnancy, and that can cause pachychoroid driven disease. Uh, intravitreal injections, tramsinolone has low systemic serum levels and is generally safe. Vertipoffin has shown uh, teratogenicity in animal studies. Uh, just one point, uh, conception is avoided for at least three months following last injections of uh, ranibizumab and aflibercept and six months following last injection of mimicizumab. Uh, VEGF, uh, Anti-VEGF can uh, cause vascular development in fetus to be uh, affected. And there are reports of loss of pregnancy in the first trimester with anti-VEGF therapy. So coming to VR surgery, local anesthesia, uh, bupivacaine is category C and can cause fetal bradycardia should be avoided. Lidocaine is generally safe. General anesthesia may be deleterious. And there are practical difficulties for pregnant women to lie supine for prolonged periods. So these are the take home messages. Uh, diabetic retinopathy can have an onset or progress. They, the screening schedule has to be known by all retina specialists. Hypertensive retinopathy uh, is another possibility. CSC and choroidal neovascular membranes can have exacerbations. Intravitreal pharmacotherapy, uh, the risks and benefits have to be carefully assessed and local and general anesthesia concerns have to be known. Thank you. Uh, very nice talk by Dr. Apurva. Uh, what is your approach uh, uh, in the uh, pre-existing diabetes uh, with increasing diabetic macular edema, Ajit sir? 
Yeah, if uh, the diabetes, uh, one is uh, diabetes uh, control status before pregnancy and always during the pregnancy also it's equally important because uh, during pregnancy these levels are likely to increase and the diabetic macular edema is likely to worsen the uh, deranged systemic control of the diabetes. In these cases, uh, usually I look for what is the type of diabetic macular edema. I don't vary so much, but uh, if it is uh, extra uh, foveal in location and there are few leaking uh, microaneurysms, probably laser I would uh, prefer compared to the injections. But if there is a spongy edema, which is uh, widespread and diffuse diabetic macular edema, probably I would uh, uh, take a steroid agent uh, for uh, sub, uh, suppression of the diabetic. I would not go for anti-V. Okay. Uh, there are a few months we need to defer anti -defer. Well, sir. Some things are minor, not of much concerns, but are very critical. Uh, you see, I personally have had experience of managing DME, but choices IVTA, what I had to pressure and obviously anti measures. Question comes uh, you know, one patient I had uh, in uh, mid 30s, he had CNV. Mm. CNV management is not so simple. And honestly speaking, that lady also I gave uh, not uh, had the courage to dentist or any other. Fortunately for me, she still has six in ten in that eye, but uh, subsequently she developed the other eye also after uh, at that time we gave in. So my question uh, to Pinash or other people is CNM, how do you approach it? Uh, you, uh, it depends on... Apurva, uh, even though it crosses, crosses the center, is not contraindicated. It's that you can't do a trophy. Yeah. third trimester. Yeah, it depends on what trimester is the pregnancy is. Most of the organogenesis and uh, maturation happens in the first trimester and middle of the second trimester. If it is late trimester, either uh, uh, depending upon the clinical presentation, either you defer for a few more days or you can still commit for an anti without any side effect. So, so let me give some more to the conversation on DME and pregnancy. Uh, I, I completely agree with the two of you that if you have somebody early on with significant DME and, and bad loss of vision, the intraocular steroids is probably the best way to go. Now, uh, a couple of other points. One is that deferring treatment of CME is probably okay in the long run um, because we do know from, from the Restore study, for example, that those patients not treated for the first year did catch up afterwards. So here we're talking about deferral of six, seven months perhaps. So no, no woman wants to go two years with poor vision but at least we have that statistic to say we can probably play catch up. The other thing is anti-VEGF, and I completely agree with you, I would not want to really give it. But Phil Rosenfeld published an article about 10 years ago, and they pulled together cases in the literature of women who were pregnant who inadvertently got anti-VEGF injections for one reason or another. Of the 20 people that were reported, three had spontaneous miscarriage all within the first trimester. So you say, well, three out of 20, that's a horrible number. So, but take a step backwards and say, what's the rate of spontaneous miscarriage in an average pregnancy in the first three months? It's 15%. So we'd never want to give it, but it's an interesting number to consider. And if your back were up against the wall, you had a woman with bilateral, significant myopic coil levascular membranes under the phobia and 2400 vision in both eyes, and she's at three months, what would you do? <laughs> there are some indications that when, uh, you know, we were interns, I put the retinopathy grade four, disc edema, an indication for termination. So there's a risk of losing vision at all. I don't know, because in case I encounter what uh, I'm telling about uh, bilateral NBM, idiopathic or myopic CNB, it's true. A made today based on that single example also. I would allow the organogenesis to mature a bit and then uh, 
go for uh, an indi purva you know for some time which i must have said what is because they uh, that's a very interesting point anyway the rate of miscarriage is up to yeah, 15% yeah, and uh, if it is bilateral 2400 vision and third month i'll call him up and ask <laughs> <laughs> Vinash, another thing. Yeah, this is a situation. I don't think so. You're going to get a clear cut answer to this, right? Whoever you ask, nobody is going have to. You managed, have you... uh, let me put it in the other way around. So I have not managed this hypothetical situation raised by Dr. Stewart, but when things of these types do turn up, so uh, the key point is uh, lies in two words of managing expectation, and that's what is important. And and you. you are not the only person who is going to take a decision for them uh, they have to be involved in decision making and so is the obstetrician so then it gets three people involved in decision making and you can suggest i have a treatment for this but sometimes you land up in certain reasons which are unfavorable so i want you to decide with the obstetrician whether you want to go in for it and then keep leave the ball in their court and leave it there family in the family decision only lady that's okay. their choice all right it's their choice it, it's a situation me, it, this is something which happens so rare in the practice that you don't want to have a reputation of your entire career looking at that one person if they have made that choice i accept it practical problem is here uh, <coughs> across the globe also more so in our country patient leaves the decision to doctor doctor you tell me what sir no but uh, what he suggested is very very valid that uh, let them take the decision certain times you are not in a position to take the decision and give him the choices and let them choose one of the others and uh, quickly i want to go through the hypertension pregnancy induced hypertension when uh, it happens in the first pregnancy second pregnancy mm -hmm. itself is a very high risk okay. these things need to be told to every junior that this can happen and this suggestion need to come up Yes. and the third uh, this thing is the conditions which are related to pregnancy though they are not directly due to pregnancy like a rheumatoidogenous detachment in a fifth month or ninth month these are situations also you need to tackle during the pregnancy which need to yes, be I, i have had the fortune or misfortune of doing tackle surgery in a pregnant who did not pose any significant issues except for the fact that positioning becomes uh, difficult if you are doing a macular surgery otherwise uh, you know i may inject silicone oil uh, because it not so detrimental you know. up to up to what uh, trimester or the how many fifth, months of uh, pregnancy the, you will take up at no fifth fifth month was the pregnancy which i had done unfortunately she had them both years so it yes. was uh, i have operated seven months as well i if any not a very critical issue yeah yes fifth to seventh month uh, we have also operated post op iop control is uh, uh, one more thing uh, theoretically beta blockers and pg analogs are to be avoided even uh, even uh, acetazolamide is to be avoided should you say this here uh, one key question we are discussing was pnvm iop or idiopathic in pregnant lady anti vegers joint uh, bilateral cnm because uh, Michael was posing this question. Uh, manage. The measures uh, will be out. And have you any time managed or any opinion about that? Yeah, it's 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 obviously a challenge. Uh, you know, sometimes the the couple of cases that I've seen, they've done once the neonatologist felt that the baby was at a at a at a point where you know the if they had a bit bit bit, bit preterm, they could be delivered. they've done early induction i've seen you know we had a couple when one patient they did an early c section not you know this was at about 36 weeks so they were nearing term so we just kind of conservatively watched and hoped that they didn't have irreversible vision loss by the time they got to that stage it's a, it's a difficult problem the problem i uh, know no actually so so we reported a case uh, there's a case of a patient um, one of my fellows actually uh, had done this uh, before of a patient who didn't know was pregnant who inadvertently got uh, avastin so we report published that many years ago so as far as we know i guess we probably should go back and collect long term because this is now almost 15 years ago now uh, to see uh, what happened uh, but that's the only time that i've done it or we've done it 
the problem one, one, with one uh, anti is uh, problem with anti vegf is not just teratogenicity it is more of vasculogenesis also in the infant that immature vasculogenesis is more of a problem and especially of the cns so Yeah. But vasculogenesis is a yeah. continuous process throughout uh, gestation. Yeah. So uh, just coming to that uh, bilateral yeah. CNV scenario, so uh, would we consider a half dose uh, anti VEGF on a, to be on a safer side, like how we use for preoperative for the, for j just a thought? Uh, sure. I don't think we have any data to say one way or another if it's less effective in the eye, if it's less teratogenetic in the body. Sure. Why not? And half dose. But theoretically, half it... dose will probably work in the eye, hmm. albeit for a short period of time. <laughs> sure. Next speaker, Dr. Sachin Mahani. Uh, no, just, just, I'm digressing a little bit. Uh, if a lady we've seen just before she becomes pregnant and she has no diabetic retinopathy, is it likely that uh, she would develop that in the nine months? If she has. Ah. At all, if one has to choose anti vegf which anti vegf uh, in such a scenario, if a larger molecule will be more safe without, because it will be less uh, crossing the blood retinal barrier? Uh, you know, the way I look at it, I think a lot of people would argue that the, the drug that stays in the systemic circulation the shortest period of time and causes the least alterations of systemic vegetal concentrations is preferred. So that being said, there's no doubt that ranibizumab is the drug of choice if you use that criteria. Now, having said that, we also have no data to say that the longer acting drugs that stay in the system longer and suppress VEGF circulations have any increased risk of anti-VEGF consequences, at least in the host. But we don't know is what would happen in the baby. That we don't know. Um, sure, if you want to pick one based on that, choose random business Yeah, Dr. Sachi. Thank you. Very good morning. Um, my this topic of discussion will be eye as a window for systemic disease. It's a wide spectrum of disease. I'll not be able to touch everything about each disease. I, I just want to sum up all the signs which we need to look for in a patient when they visit us. Uh, it's been very long, over a decade, it's been discussed, the ocular manifestation and the systemic disease. Um, I, because eye is a unique organ, it's the only tissue in the body where we can see a live in vivo arteries and uh, neurosensory uh, retina and it's uh, it's very interesting to understand the arterial size of the retina and the uh, coronary arteries are almost the same and the neuro uh, the blood retinal barrier and the blood brain barrier almost are almost the same so on this basis let's understand a lot of disease retinal pathologies which reflect the systemic condition uh, the understanding of this ocular biomarkers with a non-invasive multimodal imaging and ophthalmoscopy is termed as ocular nomics well, various categories we'll be just going through quickly, the, you know, congenital, vascular, neoplastic, metabolic, autoimmune diseases, infectious, drugs and toxins have been already covered. I'll skip this later on. Congenital diseases, few to name are Marfan's disease, which can be commonly presenting with retinal degeneration, dislocation of the lens, myopia, retinal detachments, uh, like tuberous sclerosis would present as an astrocytic hematomas, cystinosis would present like, you know, macular crystals. A Sturge Weber syndrome would have, um, you know, choroidal hemangioma, von Nippel and all syndrome with capillary hemangioma of the retina, neurofibromatosis, leash nodules in the iris. Uh, vascular changes are very common uh, clinical condition which they present to day-to-day -to -day OPD and we have a large number of patients. These are the number of patients who would present primarily to ophthalmologists first and then we may have to refer them to a physician. Um, Richard Bright, a nephrologist way back in 1836, described something called a Bright disease. It's an umbrella of disease wherein it's described glomerulonephritis along with uh, uh, retinal vascular changes and loss of vision. Uh, later on, Marcus Gunn uh, in 1982 described hypertensive retinopathy in the patients with renal impairment. Uh, coming to the vascular changes, we'll be touching upon hypertensive retinopathy, occlusive diseases like thromboembolic phenomena, CRVO, CRAO, BRVO and BRAO, and blood dyskiriasis like sickle cell anemia, leukemia and all that. So these are the pictures wherein we commonly see in our day-to-day -day OPD and which would alarm us uh, you know, to uh, investigate for the systemic diseases. Hypertensive retinopathy is the more common and which uh, will be uh, underdiagnosed in many of the cases, you know, like right from AV crossing changes um, to choroidal infarct, grade 3 hypertensive retinopathy, like a lot of cornu spots and hemorrhages with C-safe fan exudation and the disc edema. 
Sometimes we also see a copper wiring of the you know, retinal blood vessels and uh, in advanced cases like the silver wiring, what we call in you know, a complete thrombosis of the retinal arteries. Uh, these are the cases which would, uh, you know, uh, um, BRAO and CRAO would present with a different degree of visual loss. BRAO, BRAO would present with a mild visual loss or some patients can be asymptomatic. Uh, like in cases wherein you just see a plaque on the retinal artery and they would be asymptomatic and some would present with a complete loss of vision in, in cases of CRAO. These are managed basically to reduce the ocular, uh, uh, ocular uh, pressure by either by doing AC tap or giving uh, acetazolamide and referring them to a physician because these cases would stand as uh, you know, high risk of CVAs as well, cerebrovascular accidents. Uh, RBOs are very common in day-to-day -day practice. Uh, we uh, encounter a lot of cases uh, nowadays. Uh, Post-COVID, uh, you know, we are seeing uh, there is a spurt on case of uh, RBOs. Uh, they can either be a branch retinal vein occlusion or a central retinal vein occlusion. We, these cases have to be managed uh, with either anti vegfs depending on the macular edema and what stage they are presenting in. You know, they can present as severe as a neovascular glaucoma also. So we need to follow up these cases for life and we have to uh, manage them aptly with the uh, timely management of anti vegfs and requirement of steroids or laser as and when required. Ocular ischemic syndrome is a very uh, important condition which needs a very high degree of suspicion and this uh, condition is uh, knowing to have a very close association with cerebrovascular accidents. Some studies have said that as high as 10 to 15 percent of the cases would land up in a stroke or a TIA. Uh, they usually present with a very mild flare hypertony in early stages. In the later stages, they might also present with the neoscularization of iris. They can present with neoscularization of the retina. You know, uh, carotid Doppler, MR, angio would be very important and referring them to a physician to get all this done and evaluate uh, the case and manage uh, along with the physician. You know, these cases are usually managed in early cases when there is uh, when there is requirement of early neoscularization. We have to do manage with laser, anti vegfs and neoscular glaucoma can be managed again with anti vegfs or uh, you know filtering wall surgeries later on this is a very rare condition uh, hyperlipidemia in a case wherein you can present uh, we can see salmon pink vessels with yellow fundus uh, blood dyskiriasis mainly anemia is very common still though underdiagnosed anemic retinopathy we need to look which presents with retinal hemorrhages uh, leukemia of course can present either with the uh, you know disc infiltrate or white centered hemorrhages uh, sickle cell anemia can present with uh, typical C fan neovascularization. Again, these cases are managed based on the uh, condition what we are dealing with. They will require prompt laser in sickle cell anemia and follow up for life. Neoplastic conditions, uh, you know, the most important which can present primarily with the ophthalmologist would be a large cell lymphoma. Sometimes it can only present with vitreous seedings, wherein you have to do a vitrectomy for a diagnostic uh, for the diagnostic purpose. Uh, metastatic. Uh, Metastatic tumors in the eye are most common intra, uh, primary intraocular, uh, most common intraocular uh, tumors. Most common sites would be from the lungs or the, from the breast. When we talk about metabolic, it's mainly diabetic retinopathy I'll be touching on, which can present with various degrees. It can be mild, moderate, severe, or it can present with a proliferative diabetic retinopathy, or it can be presenting with a macular edema with any of these uh, forms of uh, diabetic retinopathy. Uh, this could be again the first time the patient would present with the features and you would detect them as a uh, diabetic based on the uh, findings and refer him to the physician, primary physician, treating physician. Again, these cases are managed with anti vegfs and uh, uh, laser and uh, depending on what we are treating, macular edema, whether it's central involving, not central involving, uh, based on that we can manage the conditions. When you talk about autoimmune disease, uh, they present uh, a lot of autoimmune diseases present with retinal pathologies like SLE, sarcoid, polyarthritis, nodosa, pan, patients, and even genital arthritis, which can present with the uh, optic nerve involvement, basically like an AION like picture. They usually present with uh, peri uh, peripheral vasculitis, CVITIS, vitritis, choroiditis. Uh, it can present in the ONH swelling. In cases of SLE, you can see the infiltration of the optic nerve. Uh, they can also have peripheral neovascularization, which has to be managed promptly with laser. Optic neuritis in many, case, many cases uh, we need to look for. Genital arthritis, as I said, needs a, a systemic evaluation and a temporal artery biopsy to come to a diagnosis and manage with steroids. Uh, infective conditions uh, are also very uh, commonly seen in the retinal pathologies like uh, viral retinitis, choroidal abscess. You can have choroidal, they can present with choroiditis, varying degree of choroiditis. Endogenous endophthalmitis is very common. You need to look into for the systemic uh, you know, cause of infection. Uh, septic emboli are very common uh, in, in these cases and 
the source of infection need to be find out, found out, systemic antibiotics and app management is required. This is a case of HIV retinopathy where, wherein you have to look for uh, cotton wool spots in early stages. HIV retinopathy can be uh, very asymptomatic and you know, if you have a high degree of suspicion for this. So uh, just to wind up my uh, talk, um, you know, drugs already have been discussed in the last talk, so I'll just skip that. Uh, future would be like, you know, there are a lot of al AI algorithms which people are using now. Very interesting to read the latest articles wherein they are using al or AI based al uh, or the algorithm for ocular biomarkers, especially the retinal artery caliber, retinal artery nature and the neurosensory retina, wherein they can predict a lot of conditions like, you know, uh, cardiovascular diseases and neuro neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's wherein they have uh, identified certain uh, biomarkers in the neurosensory retina which can, you know, uh, predict whether this patient is going in for Alzheimer's or not. This would be very interesting and a lot of uh, studies are coming wherein they have uh, uh, measuring the caliber of the retinal arteries and the coronary artery. There's an interesting study which was done in 2018, uh, something, uh, with the, something called Google Brain, but though it was not very popular, the study was not very popular because they uh, came up with, uh, you know, um, algorithm saying that, you know, these type of patients would develop a cardiovascular risk factor and would land up in a stroke or either the heart attacks. Thank you so much for the question. Thank you, uh, Dr. Sachi. Uh, we all know that uh, your eyes don't see something which your mind do not know. So uh, you have to have a high degree of suspicion when you look to the patient. Uh, due to short of time, I'll proceed with the next talk. Uh, Dr. Mudit Tagi, any questions on the previous talk? I think, I think which Sachin, uh, uh, beauty of an eye surgeon, actually a lot of these diseases, eye surgeon picks up first based on, uh, suppose you say vasculitis, so I picked up syphilis like this. Only thing which I wanted to emphasize was uh, about the optic nerve, this fella, a lot of times can't explain, get a field done, Save the you know yeah. pituitary adenoma and such things have been so many times all of us have uncovered that that is another rule. But when yeah. rightly stressed about uh, the other thing is about the raw spots or white centered hemorrhages, yeah. there you get this blood uh, cytology and blood count done and then you know, ischemia. Some parts where ophthalmology score is very very important, like bilateral, see some parietal uh, granuloma. You say you get your breast cancer done. Some things where you have saved lives. Also. Bilateral uh, mainly CRV was our vascular occlusion. She should always uh, rule out that this is a dictum we need to keep in mind. Can I ask a question? Uh, Dr. Stewart, if, uh, how is CRAO managed in the US if they come within, you know, say the few early few hours, within the first four, four and a half hours? I mean, in our country, there's no move to treat it like a stroke or, you know, give thrombolysis. Etc. I don't know what is the practice in the U.S. So, so in our country, this is a stroke, and this is an immediate uh, referral to the emergency department, preferably to one that is stroke uh, certified. And so they will then get neurology involved. They'll do the, re the requisite imaging, and then start patient on a post-stroke protocol. Uh, including thrombolysis, I presume. You know, yeah. Uh, if it's we, yeah, I mean, we've not had anybody that's come in within the first six hours or so for that. So we've not done that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know Vass, how, many, how often you guys are ending up doing that. We're not doing it, uh, but we get all the workups. Yeah, so, so we don't do it either. There was a clinical trial that was done, the EAGLE study, maybe some of you heard of that, which didn't really show any benefit. Uh, some patients developed other complications that when you do that kind of thrombolysis and you have to cannulate, uh, you get to dislodge other clots and the like. So because of that trial, uh, I think most people have abandoned that. But as Michael said, the critical thing is this patient has had a stroke, so they are at risk for other stroke events. So they need, they still need stroke management, even though it may not help the eye. And the biggest problem is they're very high risk of having a CNS stroke within the first week. So that's the reason why to send them down to the emergency department for us. And was the, from the ocular point of view, I think from systemic point of view, all of us are aware that, you know, uh, we do investigate and you know prevent a stroke in the brain or the other eye or the other muscular. But from the eye point of view, per se, apart from you know doing parasynthesis or massage and you know hyperbaric oxygen testing, 
Yeah. Uh, you know, occasionally one of the people in our department will pick up one of these and ask me, you know, what can we do? Do we start them on Timolol, Diamox, uh, or glycerin? And I say, no, no, no. If you really want to do something, let me stick a needle in the anterior chamber and I'll take out a little bit of fluid because that's going to work far better than anything else. How many of you in this room have ever seen that anything like that work? Have you? Okay. I, I've not. Yeah. Uh -huh. One question, how would you like to manage a case of celioretinal artery occlusion without a, a, a central retinal artery, only a celioretinal artery occlusion? And what would be the management? Can I can I answer? What yeah. is the cost of celioretinal artery? Uh, so when we evaluate it, nothing has come out to be positive in that. It's not positive. See, you have to understand that celioretinal artery occlusion can happen because of NAON, can happen because of CRV, can happen because of the thrombus. So we can't equate every celioretinal artery occlusion to have a standardized protocol unless and until you evaluate what is the cost of celioretinal artery. So, so, so that, to follow it up with that, so in our patient, it presented first as a celioretinal artery occlusion and three days later the NAIOM signs came up. So as you are also suggesting, so the, we tried to do the, uh, uh, to rule out uh, GCA, that's a giant cell arteritis, but uh, still the workup is negative. For and, that. And in that case, probably uh, NA1 could have been missed because uh, the, the celiorectal artery occlusion for it to happen, it, the consequence it's of a consequence. I do it, understand. It's not the other I way understand. around. I do so probably the subtleties where one could have missed it was something which we kept in. Or, or, or it's sequential occlusions yeah. of the posterior circulation with, from the coroidal. Oh, thank you. Yeah, please proceed to your third talk, Dr. Mudir. So, First of all, I'd like to thank VRSI for giving me this chance to talk on a disease which we are seeing more and more in our clinic, syphilis. I would also just take one moment to thank three of my teachers, Dr. Avinash Patangi, Dr. Rajiv Reddy, and Dr. Aini Mathai, three people who have taught me most of what I know about retinal infections. So we know syphilis as a disease can have primary, secondary, latent and tertiary manifestations, but a lot of times what we see in our clinics is a syphilitic coronitis, which is kind of more of a tertiary syphilis. And before I proceed further, this is one message which I wanted to give to most of our audience, which I keep on reiterating, the importance of triponemal tests like TPH and FTABS because they have got a much higher sensitivity and specificity for syphilis as compared to VDRL. We have had this mistake earlier once which we made. So remember, triponemal tests like TPH and VDRL have a sensitivity of high 90s for syphilis as compared to VDRL which is only 70%. Therefore, your go-to initial test should be TPH. Now I'll just show some cases which highlight the characteristic pattern of how syphilis may look like. So this was a 37-year-old male patient who came with this placoid coronatitis with these small lesions over in the periphery and a decrease in, in one eye in the last one week and in the other eye in the last two weeks. Also some signs of disc edema, peripheral retinitis. Remember syphilis as a masquerade can present with any sort of a presentation. This was how the autoprocess was. The OCD shows these characteristic RP nodularities and this photoreceptor damage, which is very characteristic of ocular syphilis. And when we got the patient tested, the patient came positive for TPHA. So TPHA, vasculitis, a placoid lesion are diagnosis pretty straightforward. This was a patient of ocular syphilis, also turned out to be zero positive. Was started on IV penicillin. And subsequent to that, this is how the patient was at the time of presentation with the visual acuity of count the fingers close to face. 14 days later, this is how the patient is with most of the lesions having absolutely regressed and the visual equity improved to 2030. So the point here is if we diagnose these cases in time and start their treatment, you usually end up getting a very favorable outcome. So that brings us to the second point, pattern recognition in ocular syphilis. So this is what we already spoke about, this placoid retinitis. Also remember these patterns. So if you see this ground glass sort of a retinitis with a central clearing and these multiple small miliary lesions. Now these again are very characteristic of syphilis. So you see these Keep syphilis as one of your differential diagnoses and investigate appropriately. So this is something which we had actually even published earlier. This full thickness for retinal involvement which is seen in these mineral lesions. Again, a sign which we believe is a biomarker of ocular syphilis over here. So another case which I wanted to show. So this was another patient who came to a clinic. Incidentally, had been initially thought of as an intermediate uveitis and was given a posterior subtenon before they came to our clinic. But if you look at it, you'll see these patterns. You see this ground glass retinitis, you see a placoid retinitis, and you see some of these miliary lesions. And the moment we looked at it, we thought we were dealing with syphilis, and we got the patient tested for TPHA and HIV, and like what we expected, this was a seropositive patient with a TPHA positive. Yeah, I'll just take one. Started on penicillin, 
and visual equity improved to 2030. Another case, this was again a patient thought of as an intermediate uveitis, given immunosuppression initially, then IVMP, somebody even gave Ozudex, is what you can see over here. But when the patient came to a clinic, again, these medullary lesions, a clue to the fact that this possibly was syphilis, tested for TPHA and HIV, turned out to be seropositive with syphilis, started on penicillin, and the visual equity again improved from CFCF to 2013, and most of these lesions regressed. So the point I wanted to make is a lot of times syphilis is a clinical diagnosis and you can identify them on the basis of the characteristic clinical patterns. The treatment thankfully is extremely simple. Penicillin in a dose of 18 to 24 million units for 14 days if you don't have access to that ceftriaxone. If that is also not available, oral doxycycline also has been shown to have in fact a penetration in CNS also. So that's it. The take home message is syphilis if detected in time and treated has a good visual outcome. All seropositive patients need to be screened for syphilis. And also remember, triponemal tests like TPHA have got a much higher sensitivity and specificity for the diagnosing of syphilis. Thank you so much. Very nice and concise uh, talk, Dr. Mudir. Have you seen worsening uh, after giving the penicillin cases of syphilis? No. So contrary to belief and contrary to the fact that we expect this sort of be a Jerry Shectima sort of a reaction and sometimes a worsening, we have not seen it to be honest in any of our patients. Until now, probably we may have treated on 47 or 48 patients. And in none of them, we have seen a worsening happen. Winners. Uh, so, uh, sir, your uh, needs to emphasize is that apart from this typical uh, ocular manifestations, these patients uh, must necessarily be tested. Because uh, I remember one gentleman coming from Haryana, he had uh, void lesions. Uh, the, the routine testing because of that ozone phenomena, ozone phenomena where the body sites are saturated, they become negative. You have to do all this testing in dilution, otherwise, they mislead you. He turned out to be, and he had already spread this to wife and. Mudit, if I miss in the first uh, go, which can happen with many of us, because we are not giving uh, syphilis a, that high a priority these days. What signs will alert you during the follow-up? So my first message is that every single patient of uveitis should be tested for syphilis. That is what we keep on noting because it's such a big masquerade. It can, we have had a patient who actually presented with a photograph which was absolutely similar to our TB granuloma. In fact, if somebody would have given me that as a spotter, my first diagnosis would have been a TB granuloma. But the patient turned out to be positive for TPHA. In 14 days of penicillin, the entire lesion melted away. So the first thing is that if even if we are missing the clinical sign, as a rule, all patients of uveitis should be screened for syphilis. If we have missed it and we have inadvertently given popliteal steroid, the placoid choloretinitis versus these miliary lesions start appearing. So these miliary lesions and the placoid retinitis is a clue to the fact that probably what we thought of as something else is actually syphilis. The good part is that even if we have missed it and unfortunately started on steroids, penicillin still works on them and they still subsequently improve and get a very good visual equity once we start them on the treatment. It's been interesting to see the evolution of, of syphilis in our country. When Dr. Sada and I were residents, syphilis was the great masquerader. And then it kind of faded away just a little bit. And it turned into lymphoma. Lymphoma was sort of the, the posterior segment masquerader. And then because of changes in sexual mores in the U.S., syphilis is now on the rise again. And so we're seeing more and more of it. And that's why I start to see the cases you have. And we've had three patients come through our clinic who had optic neuritis, vas retinal vasculitis, and placoid lesions. So we're seeing all the manifestations of it again. The, the, you pointed out one thing um, in your talk that I want to emphasize, and that is the rather liberal use of Osrodex. We have it. We see posterior segment inflammation, and a lot of people will reach for it very quickly. It's the, the old phenomenon, if all you have is a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. So be very careful, because I've seen syphilis patients treated with it and have worsening. I've also seen patients with toxoretinitis in a brush, brush fire fashion treated with it and then have it go out of control. So before you reach for syphilis in a patient with posterior uveitis, do rule out things like syphilis. I think we would all agree that that's one thing you want to rule out anytime you're going to reach for osmodex yeah. in a patient with, with uveitis.
We'll repeat your question if you can just speak it out. Is it slowly resolving or? Uh, I yeah. Mean so now there is this school of thought. There are some people who say that if you've got vitritis, you should probably end up also giving steroids. Yes. But sir, what sir. we have noticed is that this, this vitritis also goes away with just penicillin. We have not needed to resort to giving any of our patient systemic steroids for taking care of that vitritis. So that also goes away over a period of two to three weeks. Uh, like in our OPD, we have seen a few patients that in which the vitritis is persisting after one and a half months of starting the uh, penicillin yeah. therapy. So the vision of the patient is six by six. However, so the quality of vision is not as great because we can even clinically see vitritis. So that is what my question is. So now my to. question is, is this vitritis or is it just old leftover vitreous opacity than a debris? Because this is not active vitritis. These are just old right. cells which are now mixed with the vitreous phase over there. Right. This will not go away with any of the steroids. The only thing, if it is very visually disturbing yes. for your patient, is probably a role of an optical vitrectomy in these cases. But this old vitreous cells which are there, which are interspersed with the face, will not go with steroids. Right. And then anytime we've diagnosed syphilis-related eye disease, we'll always get infectious disease involved. And one of the things they'll usually recommend is a lumbar puncture to rule out neurosyphilis. The treatment is the same, whether you have neurosyphilis or not, but to define the disease is important because of long-term consequences. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Modit, I understand that uh, uh, TPH is the uh, part of the routine uh, test that... Uh, that are done for uveitis in your practice but if the tpha comes positive and it's the clinical picture is not fitting into any of the patterns that you have shown then what do you do do you still treat uh, no. with antisyphilis so the most important dictum in medicine and that's not for ophthalmology but for anything is that your clinical tests are a corollary to your clinical examination if you think that your disease finding is not fitting into the subset of your test you either get it repeated or you observe it carefully so i think we are discussing this because of the case which we shared so that did not look like syphilis at all in any of its manifestations. And that's why when in doubt, get the test repeated and that when we repeated it came out to be negative. So your test should always be a corollary or an addendum to your clinical diagnosis and not just the only basis for starting your treatment. Thank you. Dr. Simar Ranjan Singh for COVID in eye. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to thank the BRSA Scientific Committee for giving me this opportunity. So COVID is something that we have been all uh, through and hopefully we are past it. We, we can just hope that. So COVID and retina is what I'm going to discuss. So COVID started as a severe acute respiratory syndrome and soon we saw that it was not just respiratory. It was uh, manifestations were seen in other organs as well be it neurological, be it gastro, uh, gastrointestinal or cardiovascular. So the eye and retina have been no exceptions to that and the prevalence of ophthalmic complications of COVID-19 have now been reported to the range of 2 to 32 percent of the patients having some form of uh, manifestation. So I've tried to divide these manifestations into various forms. So one is which are likely virus related uh, complications such as the things we see in the retina may be cotton wool spots, may be retinal hemorrhages, vein occlusions. These are likely virus related. Some of them are related hydrogenic to the treatment that we have given for COVID, such as endogenous endophthalmitis, CRAO, uh, secondary to mucormycosis. And some of them are vaccine related, which have now come up more recently once we started with the vaccination. So coming to them one by one, I'm just going to show some cases that we have seen in our center related to these and which may be associated with COVID. So coming to the first likely virus related, you can see this was a report that we published. Uh, so we screened prospectively all the patients that were admitted in our ICU and in our wards uh, by our team of residents who were posted there and subsequently once they were discharged, they were screened in our clinics and photographed also. So none of them had acute changes while they were inside, uh, while they were in the first 14 days of convalescence. And following that, when they visited, we could document some changes such as the retinal hemorrhages and the cotton wool spots, which came, went, and sometimes reappeared at a separate location. So these were some of the changes that we could see. But again, they left no consequence subsequently. This was another case who presented to us with a young patient presenting with a CRBO-like picture. There was history of COVID positivity two months back, again, not very severe at home only. 
but there were no other risk factors that were present, no blood transfusion, no diabetes or hypertension and all the other tests we do for a CRV on a young also came out negative. So this was presumed because of uh, secondary to COVID. The treatment usually remains the same as we do for any other RBOs with anti vegf injection followed by PRN therapy and the patient did well. So coming to the retinal manifestations which were treatment related. So this is something serious because this is something hydrogenic most of the times because steroids became a main part of therapy of COVID once we started to learn more about it. So uh, this was a 14 year old girl who presented to us with decrease of vision both the eyes and this was the picture you can see in the right eye. You can see this abscess free retinal in the right eye and this posterior hypopion. And this was the left eye. Again, you can see those uh, kind of characteristic fungal balls in the, over the retina. And you can see the characteristic rain cloud sign that is associated with fungal endophthalmitis. We did vitrectomy. Uh, these were the, and the patient had recently diagnosed with type 1, was given intensive steroid therapy during that time. And the blood sugars were through the roof, 350 milligrams, and the HbA1c was 16.8 on no therapy as of now. So everything was started. Surgery was done for the right eye, left eye only treated with antifungals and systemic. So the patient did well, but then the diabetes is subsequently being controlled. Similarly, mucormycosis came in as a big problem uh, after the second wave of COVID. And another patient who secondary to mucor had central retinal artery occlusion in the eye. Coming to the last, the vaccine related, they are kind of similar to what we saw with COVID related because vaccine is the same antigen that is being given to stimulate the human immune response. And they have been shown to be more with the uh, antigen vaccine rather than the mRNA vaccines. Uh, so the manifestations are quite similar, but they usually come in earlier than what we saw with COVID. So this was a case, it was actually a, a paramedical healthcare worker working at one of the dispensaries, got injected with the COVID vaccine. And the next day she presented to us with this kind of picture with vitreous cells along with the CRVO kind of picture. So again, most of the, all the investigations were negative. We couldn't find anything. And interestingly on the angiogram, we will see a lot, a lot of occlusion and a lot of leakage along with, which was suggestive of an inflammatory CRVO in the eye. And this was a very acute presentation again, treated with oral steroids along with anti-VEGF, but due to that extensive occlusion ended up having an optic atrophy and a vision of 3 by 60. The last thing that I just want to show is we have been seeing some cases of recurrence of choroditis, uh, or TB choroditis earlier, which were controlled for two to three years, but following COVID vaccination, coming back in two months or two weeks with a recurrence of the choroditis at the edge, subsequently treated with immunosuppression, but again, something that is associated as a temporal association to COVID. So the pathogenesis again has been described because of the COVID vaccine binding to uh, COVID virus binding to the ACE2 receptors, which subsequently causes an increase in the ANG2, which can be related to some of these complications, such as vasoconstriction, inflammation, and uh, the uh, loss of the endothelium and more coagulative disorders. So again, SARS virus has been associated with it has been isolated from the retinal cells as well as the ACE receptors have been found on the retinal cells. So there is corroborative evidence. However, no replication or growth of the virus has been shown in the retinal tissue. And a causal relationship is at best speculative though we do have a temporal <coughs> association. And still COVID is not over. We are still seeing more manifestations and I'm sure we'll see more as our understanding evolves. Thank you. Is there any, uh, any uh, recommendation for following these patients who had uh, COVID in the uh, early post-COVID phase? Uh, Lalit, sir? COVID is still not over. I, I think that uh, you see all of us have seen vascular events, CRVO, even AIUN, opioidis we have seen. Endothermitis also I have seen uh, bilateral endothermitis. But as far as your question, recommendation, uh, not, uh, you know. Recommendation, so I definitely don't know. But yes, definitely, optic nerve is the known complication of vaccination. So we have had the largest data, as far as uh, India is concerned, on armed forces. We had the collective data from the entire country. 
So we had two cases of optic nerve solving problem, and that is uh, within a week or so. That has to be kept in Just an additional point uh, in terms of uh, COVID and supplement. So never before we ever saw as many cases as posterior, focal, endogenous ductomatis, there's a candidate. Never ever before we saw patients walking into the clinic. So unlike the West, uh, which people with endogenous are usually are very sick in India, they walk into the clinic. So that's a major difference we have. And, and unfortunately, though you had favorable response with amputation, uh, many of the patients did not do well with amputation. So the need, and they did not do well with oriconazole. So we had to scale up osoconazole. And in, in spite of osoconazole, also some people didn't respond that way. So uh, that made me think that COVID could be one of the etiological agents which we can have as for endogenous endocrine. So that's something which I wanted to share, apart from other complications. So it, it's remarkable because as we spent the first couple of years of the pandemic reading about each other's problems, the incidence of mucor and candida out of India was startling. And that's not something we'd seen. I mean, we, we've not had any uptick at all in terms of mucor or candida and ophthalmitis. I don't know what it is about the subcontinent, but there's something different about India, the environment, the population that did not exist in the United States. I think it's something to do with the protocol-driven treatment. So we did not have these patients from our institute where steroids and everything were given with a protocol. But at that time, once everybody knew that their steroids are working, preventing the uh, acute phase of going them into yeah, the cytokine So people were self-prescribing, doctors were abusing extensively without monitoring. Majority was teleconsultation. The patients were actually not seen, but they were just being given drugs. And, and, and that may well be, uh, we were much more conservative with use of steroids in the U.S. unless they really manifested uh, a lot of what we thought was some rhombolic or other pulmonary problems. Regarding how do you follow these patients after they've had the disease, I, I just follow them the same way I follow anybody who doesn't have COVID and have the same problem. I had one patient with an AMN, a PAM type picture uh, after a you know, after uh, vaccination, very remarkable. And I followed her frequently and a year and a half later, she looks exactly the same. The OCT has not changed. One iota, uh, I just follow patients the same way. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Simar Ranjan Singh. Uh, the next uh, talk is by Dr. Shivani Sina. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, at the outset, I would like to uh, thank BRSI for giving me the opportunity to present on clinical and biochemical characteristics of patients with vascular occlusions in post COVID 19 uh, rhino or vital cerebral mycormycosis. So ROCM in COVID-19 patients uh, have been our devastating uh, recent complications and uh, vascular occlusions have been associated with both COVID and ROCM. So previously also ophthalmic artery and central artery uh, occlusions were described in patients with post-COVID-19 ROCM. But the spectrum of uh, vascular occlusion and associated biochemical parameters aren't fully understood in these subset, subset of patients. So we aim to study the clinical and biochemical characteristic of patients with vascular occlusions in post-COVID-19 ROCM. So uh, it was a retrospective study taken at our COVID-19 dedicated uh, tertiary care center. And 22 patients with vascular occlusion post-COVID-19 uh, with stage 3C and 4 ROCM were included in the study. The clinical parameters uh, included uh, BCBA and complete ophthalmological examination. Biochemical parameters were also included in the study. So 22 patients either developed or presented with vascular occlusion during the course of hospital stay for ROCM treatment. Majority of the patient presented with uh, vascular occlusion. So 17 patients with stage 3C had pre-existing vascular occlusion, whereas one patient developed ophthalmic artery occlusion after endoscopic sinonasal or vital uh, debridement. Probably it was a complication of the surgery. One patient with stage 4D had bilateral uh, CRAO. So out of uh, 124 patients admitted with um, uh, post-COVID-19 ROCM, uh, approximately 18% of the patient had vascular occlusion. 
So uh, 18 patients had stage 3C, whereas one patient each had stage 4A and 4B, whereas two patients had stage 4D, uh, if we see the uh, stage by distribution. So majority of the patients were in the older, uh, were below uh, 50 years. Uh, they had, uh, they were nearly 48 years in age with a male preponderance and had three weeks since the uh, treatment of uh, COVID-19. So uh, 21 patients presented with PL negative eyes, whereas one patient who had BRAO had a, a vision of finger counting of four meters. So uh, four patients had presented with CRAO, one patient with combined vascular occlusion, one patient had BRAO and 16, patient of the, 16 of the patients had ophthalmic artery occlusion. So uh, this is the cohort characteristics and we see uh, the fasting blood sugars were elevated in all these patients with an unregulated uh, uh, glycemic control. The CRP was uh, elevated and uh, the NLR ratio were elevated in this subset, subset of patients. Serum ferritin was also higher in these subgroups. So we decided to uh, compare the group uh, with vascular occlusion that is stage 3C and the uh, group uh, three, uh, stage 3 patients who had no vascular occlusion that is stage 3A and 3B. So uh, none of the uh, parameters differed uh, significantly between both the groups like uh, the CRP was not significantly, significantly different between the uh, patients with uh, occlusions and without occlusions. So this is uh, the fundus photo of a, a patient in which the right eye showed combined uh, occlusion with neovascularization of the disc and uh, with a normal left eye fundus. We had managed to uh, take a OCT of octa of the uh, patient and we see the uh, florid neovascularization of the disc and a uh, uh, atrophic uh, retina in these patient. So we had an MRA of the internal carotid artery also and this turned out to be normal. This is a patient who had a superior BRAO and uh, in whom the vision had improved to 618 at the end of six weeks. This is the fundus photo of the right eye of a patient who, uh, which was normal and a CRAO in the left eye with a pale uh, disc uh, in the same eye. So this is the patient who presented with ophthalmic artery occlusion with a pale disc and a featureless retina with RP abnormalities also. So uh, coming to the management, 18 of the patients underwent sinonasal or vital deprivement. Three patients uh, finally landed up with exenteration. Two patients with stage 4D ROCM died. And at four weeks of follow-up, only one patient uh, with BRAO improved. None of the uh, PL negative eyes uh, improved at the end of the follow-up. So isolated ophthalmic artery occlusions with uh, orbital infarction syndrome have already been reported. And CRO is a manifestation of uh, ROCM with incidence approximately 16 to 20%. CRO can result due to the contiguous spread of the uh, fungal infection from the orbit. Uh, various case reports have already highlighted uh, the occlusions in COVID-19 per se and their uh, various occlusions have also been uh, highlighted in patients with invasive ROCM in post-COVID-19 patients. So uh, in our subset of patient, approximately 73% of the patient had developed ophthalmic artery occlusion, which is higher when compared to other uh, subset of the patients which have been reported. And the, the possibility ology is perhaps only the angio invasion of the ophthalmic artery by the fungal infection rather than uh, inflammatory markers alone to be blamed. So to conclude, this is the largest set of patients uh, uh, reported to develop vascular occlusion post COVID-19 uh, ROCM. So the limitation, basically the, uh, the full uh, lab parameters could not be worked, worked up like the dimer and the fibrinogen level in these patients and the shorter uh, a relatively shorter uh, follow-up in these patients. So uh, we can conclude that this can be uh, relevant in making both ophthalmologist and the physician treating post-COVID-19 ROCM patient be uh, aware of this uncommon possible devastating complication. Uh, and at this uh, also, I would like to take this opportunity to invite all of you to the AOS uh, midterm conference being held at Patna uh, from 6th to 8th January 2023. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shivani. Uh, what could be uh, the pathogenesis in such cases, whether it is the blockage uh, of the vessels due to the fungal hyphae per se or hypercoagulable state due to COVID, endothelial damage or cytokine activation? What do you think? Uh, what's your opinion, Dr. Agir, sir? So, I, uh, I think uh, in her uh, study, there is no clear-cut answer. 
uh, I would be very interested in uh, the ophthalmic cardiology where these parameters that they are different or not. Uh, ROCM with uh, ophthalmic artery occlusion is a severe uh, clinical happening to identify. Oops. It's the anti invasiveness. It's the anti invasiveness. Hypoblind and uh, her uh, hypopoverty, direct invasion, I need magic device, and you need what for. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, in these patients, uh, we used to give retrobulbar amphotericin B. That was one of the standard treatment uh, because we could not, uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, kind of confusion as how to treat. So post that, we have seen a kind of a pigmentary change, you know, in the periphery. The patient uh, has kind of vision. So any experience, with whether it was a complication of giving that retrobulbar uh, amphotericin, which we used to give, anybody has any experience it is just like a pigmentary change how you see in the retina so uh, any this yeah the only thing is that we don't have the pre-operative photo because these patients were very uh, bad and you know kind of a <laughs> so Bam, the, we had given tramp in uh, many of the patients yeah. with vascular occlusions and we have reported this also and maybe the RP abnormalities that we were seeing, we also saw those, yeah. those phenomenon. Yes. But that can be a sequel to the occlusion per se also because we chose those subset of patients in which we could safe, safely give TRAM like without any, like the number of patients with 3A hmm. and 3B were less when compared to 3C and 3D. Yeah. And they were already in occlusion, occlusion state. So uh, maybe that was a sequel of the occlusion rather than uh, being a, a complication, complication of, of a TRAM. TRAM. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So we proceed with the next and last talk, Dr. Akanksha Sharma. Good afternoon, everyone. I'll be presenting on uh, the diagnostic yield in a non-dilating pupil by using a scanner laser of thalmoscopy based wide field fundus photography. In a non-dilating pupil, examination by indirect ophthalmoscopy or the standard imaging system is difficult for documenting and establishing diagnosis and thus SLO based multimodal fundus imaging platforms have come into play that may bypass this drawback and give us a fundus view that is not possible clinically. The aim was to study the diagnostic yield by using SLO based imaging platforms in arriving to a diagnosis and an appropriate treatment in the non-dilating pupil. We included 25 eyes in our study uh, it was a study done over a duration of 12 months. Inclusion criteria were patients wherein pupil was non-dilating post 30 minutes of installation of topical mediatic uh, drug and clear fundus diagnosis was not possible clinically. The exclusion criteria were patients with a poor central media clarity. Image acquisition was through SLO-based Melante by NIDA. Coming to the algorithm of the study, which was patient with a non-dilating pupil post 30 minutes of insulin dilating drops is subjected to a complete slit lamp examination post determining his best corrected visual equity along with his intraocular pressure. Uh, after which SLO based multimodal uh, imaging is carried out where depending upon the pathology, patient is subjected to the required investigations. Discussing a few cases of the same, this is the first case where we can see there are multiple keratic precipitates at the back of the cornea of a non-dilating pupil with a muddy iris. The color photo of the same shows an exudative retinal detachment which involves 180 degree of the inferior retina. The FA of the patient shows an altered foveal avascular zone with leakages and the ICG shows hypersinusins from the early to late phases. This is the case which was managed with intravitreal methylprednisolone for 5 days followed by oral steroids in a tapering manner and the vision of the patient improved from finger counting at 2 meters to 6 by 24 post treatment. Coming to the second case where we can see that um, the OCT of the patient shows a fairly maintained, uh, uh, shows a foveal contour which is fairly maintained along with uh, choroidal uh, thickening. The FAF of the patient shows uh, hypo and hyper autofluorescence uh, in the peripapillary and the foveal region. The FA of the patient shows multiple areas of hyperfluorescence which was suggestive of leakages. And ICG shows hypersinuses from the early to the late stage. 
This case was managed with uh, high dose uh, steroids followed by oral steroids as well and a complete uveitic profile of the patient was advised and the patient was asked to review with reports. Coming to the third case where, where, wherein we can see that uh, the color photo of the patient shows a subretinal blood at the fovea along with a juxta papillary membrane. The white field of the same shows asteroid halosis and the OCT of the patient was fairly maintained with few uh, pigmentary changes at the level of the RP and subretinal subfoveal um, uh, fluid pocket uh, could be seen which was suggestive of CNVM. This patient was managed with anti vegf uh, and uh, the vision of the patient improved to 6-9 and at presentation which was finger counting at 1 meter. The last case where we are seeing that there, are, there is a festooned pupil with the macular edema which was managed with orzodex followed by cataract surgery and synegalysis. The results were that a color photo uh, central along with white field with OCT was performed for all patients. FA was performed for around 26% cases and ICG around 8.7% cases. The optical coherence tomography findings were graded as Shices, RD and Rusens in about 4.3% cases with thinning seen in about 17% cases and cystoid spaces, uh, spaces documented in around 13% cases. So the intervention or non-intervention based on these findings could be easily made. Uh, of our patients, around 30% were managed conservatively, 21.7% surgically. anti vegf with uh, methylprednisolone was used in around 8.7% cases. PST can occur in around 13% and PRP sittings were done in 4% cases. So coming to the discussion, uh, in a study by Tripathi et al, they have used Optos, which is provided to be an important tool for imaging the peripheral fundus in case of uveitis with non-dilating pupil, where objective documentation and patient counseling became extremely easy. Idris et al have documented importance of ultra-wide field multimodal imaging systems in capturing images in diabetic patients who otherwise have a poor response to mediatic agents. Uh, again, Tripathi et al have also documented the use of the ultra-wide field imaging and angiography uh, by SNO-based optos in uh, detecting and demonstrating the extent and activity of ARN uh, and the response to therapy in non-dilating pupil. Lastly, SNO-based imaging is superior to the traditional fundus photography and evaluation of small non-dilating pupil, which allow a better yield in terms of diagnosis and management. Apart from a clear fundus view, OCTA, FA, ICG can be easily carried out on these SLO-based multimodal imaging modalities. Thank you. We all know that this ultra wide field uh, imaging has uh, gone a uh, long way uh, in uh, diagnosing these peripheral retinal disorders in small pupils. Uh, what is uh, what? Are, how do you think it is um, uh, going? Uh, is changing the practice pattern uh, uh, than the way we used to treat uh, clinical diagnosis and uh, treating the patient? This so, uh, has been discussed yesterday in the imaging uh, session as well. Uh, that SLO based imaging systems are uh, very likely good of uh, exploring a lot of uh, clinical findings which we cannot detect clinically uh, by performing the test we are eliciting more signs so that we can arrive at a definitive diagnosis. Especially when the media haziness is uh, in uh, clear examination not finding the sign. I think we're all finding good uses for it in terms of small pupil, vasculitis, peripheral disease that we're maybe missing just by ophthalmoscopy. So in my department, I'm having a problem because all my anterior segment surgeons are doing it on every patient and it's backing up our imaging room uh, because the bottom line is they love to look at those images, therefore don't have to pay as much attention to ophthalmoscopy. So it is really prevalent if you would ask us 15 years ago, would we be using ultra wide field like this? I think the answer was no, not in the retina community. We never thought that would be the case. That was something the optometrists used, but it's not something that we used. That, the cell -based, that is the whole indication that small people get wealth of information by just to, uh, and you are lucky that you have this in the ante. Thank you. People who don't have, you are just advocating that this gives wealth of information and may change your. Diagnostic as well as therapeutic. Uh, Absolutely. That's the whole message. Dr. Uh, I have a question. Uh, like, what is the temporal sequence of clinical diagnosis? And uh, the steroid therapy, IV methyl prednisone, you were mentioning. Yes. Uh, and investing. So what would you do? So what would we do in case of uh, what uh, uveitic investigations we advise for the patient? 
Yes. In your uh, presentation, it was um, it's one of the slides showing uh, you have start having with the investment plan and then uh, gone for investigation. Yes, sir. sir. Actually, the patient has presented to us with a multifocal choroiditis, which was involving the macula. So, sir, before uh, since the macula was threatened in that case, uh, in that case, sir, we advised the patient to start on high dose steroids to at least, uh, uh, I mean, uh, to just make sure that the macular involvement uh, uh, could be resolved at the earliest. And uh, the uh, we we advise the patient of a battery of investigation in the form of. TPHLX or I discussed, uh, we do a Montuk test on a regular basis, chest x-ray. Uh, sir, uh, these are the basic investigations along with serum A's that we advise to our patients. Right. Thank you. So we conclude the session here. I request Thank wise you. councils and all the presenters to come forward for a group photo.